Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sam DeFries. I'm the head of networks at Community Fiber. And this presentation is actually really a story. Um, it's a story about our IPv6 deployment journey, uh, talking about some things that went well, some of the things that didn't go quite so well, um, and how our design changed and why from plan A through to plan B. Um, and this story really started on my first day at Community Fibre, um, which was in January of this year. I was called into a meeting room by our ex-CEO, our CEO at the time, and he said to me, Sam, I want you to deploy IPv6 to our customer base as soon as possible. Um, great, I said, but do you know the reason that he gave me for wanting this project done? He said, the reason that I want IPv6 deployed to our customer base is because I want us to win the best consumer ISP ISPA award. He said, hyperoptic win it every year, um, they get praise for their IPv6 deployment, they're our main competitor, and it winds me up. So there we are. Whatever the motivation was, I was pleased to do the project, and this is the story of how we managed it. Um, and I should say on a positive note for our ex-CEO that despite, uh, despite his wishes, Hyperoptic didn't win the Best Consumer RSP Esper Award, but unfortunately, neither did we. Um, so who are Community Fibre? So uh, despite the name of Community Fibre, we're not uh, you know, a bunch of tech-savvy hippies or a not-for-profit or anything like that. We're, uh, the name really stems from the fact that we are present within much of London's social housing, and that's where we started. Um, but we're very proud of that fact, obviously. But we're the largest fibre to the home provider in London now. Um, so we're in uh, 2018, we were shown to be the fastest ISP in the UK, according to thinkbroadband.com speed tests. We've got over five stars, uh, well, we have five stars, sorry, on Trustpilot from over a thousand reviews from our customers. Um, and from a technical perspective, our marketing team certainly like to consider us a disruptor. Uh, a good example of that is that we were one of the first people in the UK to be using XGS Pond. Um, we've been using XGS Pond since the tail end of last year on our access network. Um, and over a third of our network now uses XGS Pond. And everything new that we roll out is XGS Pond based. Uh, in terms of our network size, we've got over 250 kilometers of fiber in the ground, chiefly through BT's PIA product, and we've passed over 100,000 homes. Um, so what do we want to achieve here? So clearly, obviously, we wanted to roll out IPv6 to our customer base, but we had to do that without spending any money. Um, we also wanted to win the Best Consumer ISP ISPA Award, but let's skip over that one. Um, I think from a technical perspective, we don't use CGNAT or anything like that, so we, we give each of our customers an IPv4 address. It's a very expensive way of building a network. Um, you know, $20 per IP address, it's painful. So obviously we want everybody to be using IPv6, and for us this was the first step towards that, rolling it out ourselves. Potentially also it could be the first step towards some kind of V6 to V4 translation strategy, maybe a map T or a map E. Um, I'd be interested to talk to anyone in the audience that's, that's done that or, or, or tested that. Um, and we also thought that we had a really nice, simple plan A. This should have been a very simple project for us to, to complete. Um, and we made some very interesting discoveries along the way. Uh, we found some great ways of breaking our own network, some that are slightly embarrassing, but I'll still share them. Um, and we found that the IPv6 internet has got some, some, some interesting black holes, depending on who you use for transit. Um, so what did our network look like before this project? Um, so we have around 75 pops in the ground, a pop being a cabinet with an OLT and a router in it. That router being kind of acting like a BNG and providing every, all of our customers connected to that pop a DHCP v4 uh, service and address as, as a service. So it's a distributed DHCP v4 design. And plan A was very simple. It was essentially to use that cabinet router in exactly the same way and provide DHCP v6 with prefix delegation and dual stack all of our customers. However, we unfortunately immediately hit a few problems. So upon leaving that CEO's room, I sat down, I opened the feature, seat, feature sheet for that router, and found it doesn't support the HTTP v6 with prefix delegation, either as a server or for relay. Um, so plan A didn't even get off of the ground, didn't even make it to the whiteboard, to be honest. So at that stage, you start thinking, you know, what do I do here? What's the next step? Uh, I'm not sure about you, but if you've ever tried speaking to your finance department around getting money for an IPv6 migration strategy, not the easiest thing to do. So I went home that evening, mulling over a few ideas, uh, and got awoken by a phone call at 3 a.m. by my CEO. Very excited, very agitated. Sam, great news. I found out that our OLT supports DHCP v6 uh, with prefix delegation for a relay server. Oh, great, brilliant. A little bit miffed that I didn't think of it, but anyway, 
So we had a design, we had a new plan that was centralized DHCP, using that OLT within that cabinet as a DHCP V6 relay. Um, so plan B is now widened in scope. It's gone to roll out IPv6, but also look at centralizing DHCP. Um, and the more that we looked at a centralized DHCP design, the, the more advantages we saw to it. Uh, a much simpler form of management for us there, much easier to log. Uh, we get more functionality from a dedicated server. Um, there's free options on the market, which is always very handy, especially when you haven't got any finance behind the project. Um, and just interestingly, I thought the centralized design shown above looks quite a lot like our logo in the top right corner. So seems like a good fit. <laughs> um, and it's so, so like I say, in terms of this project, it's now grown in scope. We've got DHCP v6 um, and DHCP v4 to centralize. So what we did is we decided to kill two birds with one stone, roll out DHCP v6 first on the centralized servers. Um, so our customers have an IPv6 address, and we basically use DHCP v6 to proof of concept our centralized design and bring DHCP v4 later once we know that it works well. And Happy Eyeballs helps us quite nicely with that, in that if we break the HCP v6, our customers probably won't notice, whereas if we break the HCP v4, they definitely will. So first, an IPv6 subnetting plan. Nothing's going to keep an audience in fraud like subnetting, right? Um, so we have 75 pups. We have a slash 29 IPv6 block from RIPE. And what we decided to do, possibly slightly controversially, um, is because we have a mix of business and residential customers, was to provide a slash 48 to all of our customers. Uh, residential or business. I'm sure a lot of people are using slash 56 for their residential customers, um, but we've gone with slash 48 purely really for the simplicity of it. Um, but the one disadvantage using slash 48 for everybody is obviously you're going to burn through your available addressing much quicker, um, and we're going to have to go to RIPE and, and ask them for more addresses at some point. Um, so which server did we choose to use? Uh, we chose Kia, which is the OSC's newest open source DHCP server. Um, and there were a couple of reasons. I'll go through the, the, the requirements that it met technically, but it's actually, we found, very simple and quick to test and use. The software is available online. The documentation is extremely thorough and also there. And we were able to spin up an instance and start testing within a day, and we were quite new to all of this. Um, and in terms of the technical requirements we had, you know, it did the HCP v4 server, did v6 with prefix delegation, very good flexible static assignments of addressing for v4 and v6, good forensic logging of customer to IP. One of the main concerns I had with centralized DHCP was redundancy. Um, we really didn't want a single point of failure in the network for something so critical. Um, and good redundancy options are built into Kia with active standby or load balancing. Um, and there's also a REST API that you can use to integrate into existing tooling. Um, slightly simple diagram. Um, but this is the uh, design that we've gone for. So we've got three servers, uh, one in Telehouse North and one in LD8 um, in, our, in our existing kind of infrastructure, and then one sat in AWS uh, via Direct Connect, reachable via Direct Connect, as a kind of uh, uh, backup. So, so we're using Telehouse North as our primary, LD8 as backup, and then AWS as a standby server. Um, and it's all worked fairly well. We don't have any dedicated databasing. We're using Memfile uh, because we found it quicker and easier, really. Um, and, and other than a few teething problems that I'm going to take you through now, it's, it's worked quite nicely for us. So what went wrong? So the first one was a financial restriction. Unfortunately, only 80% of our pops have an OLT that supports DHCP v6 with Relay. Um, the other 20% uh, the OLT doesn't support that, so we've been unable to roll out IPv6 there. And I've kind of hinted at this already, but it's a, it's a very difficult conversation to have with your finance team if you need to spend money, um, we, you know, if the feature's never going to be available on that hardware. You, know, you go to them and say, can I, can I buy this new piece of equipment so we can uh, roll out IPv6 for this pop? Well, yeah, how much is that going to make us? Well, nothing at the moment, but at some point IPv4 is going to be deprecated. Well, come back to me nearest that date. And it is a logical argument. It's a difficult one to, to, to get around. So it's something that we're going to have to approach from an um, you know, end-of-life type cycle, I think. Uh, this is the slightly embarrassing one. So what did we do wrong in our network? Um, we rolled out around five or six pops quite successfully by this point. Um, and we decided to automate the deployment just to standardize it, make it a bit quicker and smoother. Um, and unfortunately, as part of that automation, we set the gateway address as an available lease. Um, so I rolled the pop out, lease gets taken, 
at some stage in the future, everything broke quite severely. We had to go in there, fix it. Obviously, we figured out why and fixed the issue, but, but a slightly embarrassing one and a, a nice lesson learned for us. Now, this one was very interesting for me. Uh, so we first, uh, when we first started testing IPv6 in the lab, we were using a default route to Cogent um, on IPv6. Um, and we set Google as our DNS servers and couldn't resolve any host names. Trace routing showed everything dying at our Cogent Transit. Uh, quick Google found me this cake online, which does actually look quite delicious. But um, we, we basically found that Cogent have a black hole to Hurricane Electric and clearly Google. So I don't know if there's anyone in the audience here from Google, if you could maybe send them another cake and see if you can peer with them as well. I don't know. But so, so yeah, we, we, we basically had this black hole issue. To work around it, we have a p &I with Google. Uh, we went for a full table with, uh, with Cogent and with uh, our other transits. Um, and we're peering at links on Lone app as well, if anybody's interested in peering with us. Um, and <coughs> Kia problems. So we did hit quite a, quite a nasty bug in Kia um, as well. Um, we'd rolled out around 50% uh, of our pops by this point. Um, and Friday evening, um, rolled out of the final few. Well, a, a, fine, a, a few more, sorry. Um, and, and immediately noticed that CPU and, uh, started rising and memory started being uh, consumed. Um, and throughout the course of the weekend, as you can see from the graph, it got worse and worse into, into, into death status really early in the week. And basically, we'd hit a bug within Kia uh, where the traffic levels that we were now um, sending to it, there was an issue concurrently handling the inbound client requests and, and, and performing partner lease updates. Um, so to, to fix it on Tuesday evening, we disabled um, high availability um, and, and just had a single server. Um, everything began working again, and then Kia have now fixed the bug, or ISC have fixed the bug for us in, in version 1.6. So finally, out the other side and into successful IPv6 deployment. Um, we have around 20% of our traffic now running over IPv6. Um, it would be, I think, nearer to 25% if we had all 100% of our pops using v6, but as I said, we don't, unfortunately. It's the expected destinations. Um, it's your Googles, your Facebooks, Netflix, Twitch, Akamai, etc. Um, and yeah, we had some really happy customers. We had some that were really pleased to be using IPv6 and, 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 and contacted us to say so. We had far, far, far more that have absolutely no idea they're using IPv6 um, at all, but you'd expect that, I guess. So in conclusion, and to let everyone go for their coffees, you know, we, we like Kia, we think it's great. Um, the ISC guys have asked me to say, if you do want to test Kia, please try and simulate with it with uh, realistic traffic uh, levels and in, in, in an environment that's, that looks like your network. Um, we took an ISC support contract in the end as well. Um, and, and this is purely off my back saying this, they haven't asked me to. I, I think they're really good, really technical, really helpful. Um, it's been money well spent for us. It's helped our design no end. Uh, DHCP is fundamental to how our network works, so it made a lot of sense for us. So the key takeaways really for everyone from this talk, you know, don't set the default gateway as an available lease address. It's just not a good idea. Don't rely on Cogent with a default route for IPv6 or maybe even use them at all. Um, and you know, do test Kia if you run DHCP servers and, and see if you like it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Sam. Um, I was going to say, have we got any questions? But we've got one at the front here from Rob. Okay. Thanks, man. Uh, hiya, uh, Rob Evans from Janet. Um, you were talking about slash 48 to the, to the customers, you've got a slash 29, you might need more addresses, so yeah. that's kind of 500,000 slash 48s. Um, how close are you to that point? Do you do kind of regional aggregation of prefixes, or are you carrying around each slash 48 in your routing table? Yeah, so we're, um, we're doing some aggregation, yeah. So basically each of our POPs can, uh, has around 4,000 customers at most, so we've been putting a slash 36 to each POP. Um, and then, you know, however many customers there can use, use within that block. So I think we can, you know, we, we'll be able to get to 128 pops at most. So we, we've got a bit of time. Um, but it, it, I hope it's not going to be an interesting conversation with them, but I honestly don't know. It's kind of unclear um, in the documentation that I've seen whether this is a, a supported design or not. Some people seem to recommend it and some don't. Yeah. Okay, th thanks. I mean, I'm thanks. pretty sure there are some of the larger ISPs that have already got... Um, 
anything up to a slash 19, I think, some, some of them have. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah that's good to know. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions for Sam? Okay, thank, thank you very much, Thanks. Sam.